Join me. Together, we can rule the galaxy as father and son. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Nerdy Multiverse and yet another breakdown. Today, we will be breaking down and giving our initial thoughts on episode 7 of the Ahsoka series. An episode with loads of shocking turns, world building, and references, great action sequences, and a pretty entertaining and fun episode that felt just like Rebels. And this episode being titled, Dreams and Madness. And this episode actually starts off on Coruscant as Hera is here on trial to save her role as general in the New Republic, and explain everything that has been going on, standing before the New Republic Council. Amongst the Council are a few familiar faces, of course the main one being Mon Mothma who has been a major figure in the Senate throughout time ever since the Republic itself has been a thing. We also see Senator Ziono once again, and this is the father of the main character of the Resistance series, Kazuda Ziono. And of course, we cannot forget about the iconic Mon Calamari Admiral right next to Ziono. Admiral Akbar, of course. He's got the same exact outfit on, so I'm pretty sure this is him. But he doesn't have any lines or anything here, but still, it is cool to see him around nonetheless. There are also two unnamed senators here, as far as I know at least, but one of them is a Sullustin, which is the same species as Nian Nunba. Basically, throughout this entire hearing, Senator Ziono is just ripping into Hera and her actions, which is a little suspect as he is so keen on denying any of this Thrawn stuff, but I highly doubt he would be a traitor, just due to the fact that he has a connection with a character in the Resistance series, which takes place after this series, and by that time, he is still a Senator. He scoffs at any thought of there being any Imperial remnants and that Hera's stories read as fairy tales and there's no reason to believe in any of this. Which is where Carson Teva interrupts and mentions the conflict on Mandalore. Of course, referencing the most recent season of The Mandalorian with Moff Gideon and the destruction he and the battles that occurred there caused. And Ziono just absolutely dismisses this as well, saying that Moff Gideon was just a warlord acting on his own. Which just isn't true as we all no, he had connections with other Imperial higher-ups as well. And it's not looking too good for Hera here, and it seems almost as if she is set to be stripped of her rank. But a friend comes to her rescue, as none other than C-3PO enters the room on the behalf of Princess Leia. He informs the council that Leia has approved of Hera's mission, and if they have any issues with this order, they can go and speak to her about it directly, completely silencing any doubt of Hera's rank and her mission. As Leia is very high up in the New Republic, of course, as why wouldn't she be? Mon Mothma walks over and tells Hera that she knows that Leia did not approve of her mission at first, and just did it now to save her rank. But she doesn't really care for that, as she herself is worried about the return of Thrawn, and wonders how serious it truly is. And Hera tells her that it is serious and that they must prepare for the worst and hope for the best. Which is true because underestimating someone like Thrawn, no matter how many resources he does or does not have, is a grave mistake. He is the greatest strategist out there and he is not an opponent to take lightly. We then finally get back to Ahsoka as the Purgle continue traveling through hyperspace. As she goes through some of her training techniques inside of the training room on the T6 Jedi shuttle. And as she trains, she is guided and encouraged by a hologram of Anakin Skywalker during the Clone Wars, this being the last hollow message that Anakin gave to Ahsoka. Anakin says that during this war, she will face much more than just droids, General Grievous, Asajj Ventress, and Count Dooku on the battlefield. Hearing Ventress being mentioned for the first time ever in live action by Anakin was super cool. I really wish that we got to see more of her. And if you didn't already know, Ventress herself was a knight sister and she was a very skilled combatant and force user. I mean, she is the one who is responsible for Anakin's scar on his eye. Ahsoka tells Hu Yang that there are 20 or more of those hologram messages from Anakin. I think those would be cool to see as well, but also a great gift to someone like Luke or maybe a Padawan of hers to watch over. The Purgle have come to the end of their hyperspace travel as they exit into the new galaxy and right in front of Peridia. But something is not right here as the Purgle start getting hit by a massive minefield set out by Thrawn's forces as they did know that Ahsoka was coming. Ahsoka uses her piloting skills, much like her own masters, to navigate through the minefield untouched as she approaches the planet, she is then attacked by some starfighters so she escapes and hides in the ring of Purgle bones surrounding the planet of Peridia. 
Thrawn is then informed by Enoch, his captain, that as predicted, the Star Whales arrived with a T-6 Jedi shuttle amongst their pod. Morgan gives Thrawn all of the data that she collected from the Inquisitorius on Ahsoka Tano. This information will tell them everything that they need to know about her, such as her homeworlds, her master, and much more. Once Thrawn learns about all of this information, he orders for the Starfighters to be pulled back, and says that if she is anything like her master Anakin, she will be reckless and dangerous. So they will put her in a position where she has the freedom to go where she wants. He knows that she will go seek out Sabine and Ezra before going after him, giving him the advantage of time. And this is just a taste of Thrawn's chess playing and his strategies to defeat his enemies. He does not always need to defeat them in battle, he just has to out-strategize them. As the hermit crab people migrate their homes elsewhere, of course Ezra and Sabine are amongst them as well. And the two talk for a bit and Ezra expresses his excitement about getting back home, but he still wonders how Sabine got here and such. And surprisingly, Sabine still doesn't tell him much about what's going on and how she got there. She does, however, catch him up on all of the recent events, such as the Empire being defeated and the Emperor being killed. Ezra doubles back and again questions if the Emperor is dead and she says that is what some say. This is, in my opinion, obviously referencing the fact that he isn't actually dead and returns in the sequels. Thrawn requires the Great Mother's assistance once more as they search for Ahsoka in the planet's ring, all while Ahsoka uses a force and her connection to Sabine to reach out to her and find out exactly where she is on the planet. After she uses the force and finds Sabine, the Great Mothers locate her almost as if they were able to sense her presence faster because she used the force, but who knows. Once they locate her, they immediately begin firing upon her with the giant hyperspace ring and they also send more fighters after her. We then see Shin and Balin pull up, overlooking Ezra and Sabine and the Hermit Crab people, where things get a little bit weird and kind of shocking if you ask me, as Balin tells Shin to stay and fight and take her role with the new Empire, saying her ambition drives her in only one direction and he is on another path, obviously to seek out this unknown power that is here calling out to him but reminds her that impatience for victory will guarantee defeat. This basically describes the mentality of the Sith themselves. They always got cocky and grew impatient and angry that they tried to rush for a victory, which ultimately got them killed or defeated in a battle. This happened with Darth Maul on Naboo and with Anakin on Mustafar. They grew impatient and it costed them a defeat. The two then send the very samurai-esque looking nomads over the hills to go and attack Ezra and Sabine and the Hermit Crab people. This for some reason reminded me of the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies where the orcs watched over and then attacked their enemies while riding on the backs of wargs. Ahsoka then jumps down from her ship and enters into the scene as Ezra and Sabine get surrounded. Ahsoka is met by Balin's skull as they ignite their sabers and get into yet another duel. Balin clearly has the upper hand for some time here, blocking every single attack and countering with his heavy-handed strikes much like Vader's. Even then, just catching Ahsoka his lightsaber hilt before she is able to strike him, where he tells her that she cannot defeat him. Ahsoka smirks and says, perhaps, but I don't have to, as Hu Yang flies past, firing flares off to distract Balin long enough for Ahsoka to ride off and go assist Ezra and Sabine instead. This is likely what Balin wanted, he didn't want to fight her nor cared to, and he has no interest in that, which is exactly why he doesn't follow after her and instead just continues to go on his own path. Obviously, he is going to seek out this power that calls to him here on Peridia. Again, as to what that is, we still don't know. I've seen tons of different suggestions and theories about what it could be, whether it's a gateway into the world between worlds, one of the Mortis gods, the Wills, the Bendu, or even the trapped and exiled mother of the ones known as Abeloth, the embodiment of pure evil and death. But all I know is, whatever it is, or whoever it is, will likely be a big thing going forward, and is why Thrawn and everyone else is so keen on leaving and fast. Sabine and Ezra take on Shin and the Nomads together, and Ezra doesn't actually use any weapons here as he says that the Force is his ally. A very Chirrut Imwe thing to say, but I think that it also reflects on what Kanan Jars, his own master, once said. Having a laser sword does not make you a Jedi. Although I do 
wish we could have seen some Ezra lightsaber action as he was pretty skilled, especially towards the end of Rebels. But anyways, he uses a force to block and hold back Shin's saber attacks as Thrawn's night troopers then arrive. But before they are able to begin firing at them, Ezra stalls them and says that they can just talk this through. This was a very Ezra sort of thing to do. But of course, they aren't going to just buy that, so they get ready to fire on them as Ahsoka barges through their lines and joins Sabine and Ezra. As she takes on Shin, using only her hands to fight her as Shin uses her saber, showing that there are levels to this and Shin is nowhere near Ahsoka's level. This is exactly what she did in Tales of the Jedi against the Inquisitor in which she made very quick work of him. As the battle continues, Thrawn and Morgan Elsbeth observe the battlefield, and Thrawn takes notice of the fact that they are short of one of the mercenaries, as Balin Skull is nowhere to be found. Clearly, he has had that feeling of betrayal coming from Balin and he just wants to dispose of him. Whether it is that they kill him or just leave him there, it doesn't matter to Thrawn. Sabine and Ezra take down the night troopers and Thrawn recalls them as he has no need in wasting valuable resources and his men. Ahsoka is now distracted and lost her greatest ally she could have had here, being time. Now when the night troopers are actually taken down, they don't disperse into green mist or magic, which you would assume would happen as they are likely resurrected soldiers by the Great Mothers. But this is just likely because their magic is different to that of Morgan Elsbeth's, as she created Merok, who could have been an apparition and not a zombie. These are likely zombies, not apparitions. The Chimera is now nearly full of the cargo and they are closing in on being ready for their departure. This battle was a success and Thrawn takes it as a victory, as now time is on his side and not Ahsoka's. Again, displaying Thrawn's incredible intellect and strategies. Thrawn's troopers disperse and leave and Shin is left behind all alone, almost like they didn't inform her of the retreat. Anyways though, Ahsoka reaches her hand out and says that she can help Shin. And you can kind of see Shin just stand there and think about this like she's conflicted with everything that is going on, but she does just end up turning around and running off. I think that she is very clearly very hurt by the fact that her master practically just abandoned her, and she may even hold hatred towards Balin now. She could be returning to Thrawn, or she could be looking for Balin to exact revenge on him for leaving her. Ezra and Ahsoka finally get their proper reunion, and everything is looking good and happy for them, as Ezra says that he has a feeling that they are close to getting back home, finally. But of course, that isn't so simple. Anyways though, this is where the episode ends off. And overall, I actually enjoyed this episode quite a bit, especially after I watched it a second time. Now, I've seen a lot of splits regarding it, but I thought it was a pretty good one. Yes, it was obviously a step down from the previous episode, but it helped set up the finale and it had some great action in it. I also thought that this episode really felt like a live action Rebels episode. Ezra felt so much like animated Ezra and Ahsoka keeps on returning to that original Ahsoka sort of vibe, being happy and hopeful about everything everything. There is still quite a bit to wrap up in the finale, but also I feel like some things are going to purposely be left untouched or unanswered, as they likely have more projects and spin-offs regarding this all scheduled, like a movie with Thrawn as a villain, and I don't see the good guys winning in the end in this one. Balin himself is a whole different topic, and he's so interesting and so intriguing, and honestly one of the most interesting aspects of the show. I really wish Ray Stevenson was still around to see how much fans love his character. He was such a great actor. But anyways, I can't wait to see where his story heads in the finales, and I think personally I would give this episode a 7 or 7.5 seven out of 10. And I'm very excited for the next episode, which is the finale, which is kind of unfortunate as this series felt like it went by so quick. But all of it has been so enjoyable. But of course, I would like to hear about your thoughts on this episode as well, so make sure to leave them down below. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed our breakdown and review on this episode, don't forget to give it a like. And with that being said, we will see you all the next time that we go through and explore the nerdy multiverse.